Okay. Just watch him. You're gonna sit down. This moves. I'm gonna hold it, but it's gonna move. <laughs> oh, it's I didn't know I was gonna be on the floodlight. Can you slide back low? Yeah. There you go. But John, as I say, whatever was going on, John was there with the training, with the meetings. A very special man, uh, very kind, uh, very dedicated. John still cares today about things that are going on with the squad, still comes to the meetings. He is a leader. He, he just, um, he's a very, very decent, good person. And his intentions have always been honorable. He had the foresight to join, you know, to create the first aid squad and to mandate that the members had training, got them uniforms. Yeah, he was always there. You know, whether you needed him, he came to, you know, he was always at the drills. Uh, you know, he was like the glue for many years that, you know, held us, uh, you know, held us together. John William Mentioner, Sr. I started in 1955, and we made our first call in 1957. Well, I was on a first aid squad in East Keensburg for five years, and we bought a house down here. Uh, every time we come down and see if the house was dead doing, I tried to find the first aid squad, and I couldn't find one. Well, an electrician was here one day, and I asked him, where's the first aid? He said, oh, we don't have a first aid. I said, well, what do you do for an ambulance? Well, Lakewood comes up, or Freehold comes down, and that's what we have to settle for. And uh, for some reason, I looked at him and I said, maybe I could start one. He says you could. Well, I found out later on he was on the board here. He was voted in, the guys that run the town. And uh, he says, if, if you could start one, I'll, I'll, I'll give you $1,000 towards it if the town don't give you anything towards it. So I thought, I'd be fine. So he left and I stood there and I thought, you know, I don't know anybody around here. How, how, how can I, how can I start a first aid when I don't know anybody? I know what I'll do. I'll join a fire company. So I joined the fire company and I met, nope, up with, in about six months I had about 10 guys interested. So I decided to continue and I talked to the township with a lawyer. They, they let him work with me. And we incorporated it, and we, I named it Howell Township First Aid Squad Number One, because I didn't want an, another number one. If there's another one, it ain't gonna be number one. So anyway, then I started getting them their courses. I had a, a, a instructor come in, and he talked about first aid squads, and he started giving them some first aid, and all you needed in them days was 10 hours with a Red Cross. That's the, was the first course. If you wanted to take the big course, it was 16 hours. So I had him take the 16 hour course. And well, we didn't have an ambulance or anything. The AMVET up, up at, I think it was Irvington, was selling their ambulance. It was uh, 10 years old, but it had hardly no mileage on it because they never used it much. So we went up and looked at it, we bought it and brought it down, and that was our first ambulance. Then I needed had a place to put it, and I asked the fire company if I could keep it in there, and they said no. So uh, I looked around and see if we had it first. And, well, it ended up in John Mulaney's garage. He's a plumber, and his garage, he is, is separated from his house. And he's got all his plumbing equipment in there. He moved it all out. It was big enough for his two trucks. And we backed our ambulance in. And when we first started our call, our call it was in 50, 57, and it was in Freehold. And there was a lady who lived across the street from the fire company. 
forget her name, Marion something. And she called me and she said, give the police my number and if they're ending all the uh, information for the call, and I'll go over across the highway, which was a two-lane road, cement road, and I'll blow the siren on if they let me use the siren. So that's what we did. She'd blow the siren, we'd get the ambulance out, pull into the front of the fire company, and she'd give us the name and an address, and we'd go on a call. Well, that lady done that for quite a while in any kind of weather. I don't care if it was raining, I don't care if it was snowing, she'd be out there in her bathrobe waiting for us in the cold weather, and she'd give us the information where the call was. So I decided I, we, I, we couldn't put up with that much longer. So I got a hold of a phone company, and they gave us three phones that hooked them up for us on and, the, and uh, Al Schubeck's wife started the ladies' auxiliary for me. So three ladies from the auxiliary took turns and they had a switch on there. You push the switch, the toggle switch, and it rang the siren. And, you, and uh, we had a phone in, in where John's garage was, where we had kept the ambulance. We'd get in there, we'd pick up the phone, and he'd, they'd tell us where the call was. And they took turns. Whatever lady took day it was, she would be on 24 hours. And then some, one of the, it was three ladies, and then some other lady would have another day, and that's, that's the way we took the calls then. <clears throat> so that worked out pretty good. Before we could really get started, we had to have a, a, an affair. It was in Jackson. And the guy let us use his place. He had a bar and grill there, and we sold tickets and we made some money so we could buy some equipment. And, and, and uh, Lakewood gave me a lot of equipment that they weren't using anymore. We used that for it. All we needed uh, was a um, oxygen. So the businessmen even tripped in and each one of us had a little oxygen tank in our car. And the rigs were pretty well fill, all filled. That was, of course, before we st actually started. Then when we started, we had all the equipment we needed, and we went into service. And as the years went by, we kept improving and improving. Finally, the lady next door, I found out Thelma Addison, she worked at the school, wanted to sell this property. So I stopped at her house and I spoke to her and she said, yes, she wants to sell it. And she says, if I, if I could afford it, I would give it to you because I know we need her first aid, but she needed the money. So we raised the money for the land and it was a hill here. And we started putting up to the hill building. They had to cut the whole top down and we ended up with the, with the building that we have now. And uh, years went by, Charlie Carini owned the land next door, and uh, that was a farm then, 16 acres. And he sold it to Wawa and told them only if you give the squad a, 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 an acre alongside of where we are in now, an acre of land. That's how we got this new building. Finally, we got a new building here, and we got acre of land. Kept buying ambulances, what we needed, and we were in business. You got any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, you probably covered every, almost every question I had written down here. You just, man, you, 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 you nailed it. My name is Marv Venishall. I joined in the spring of 1962. I'm John Rainey. I joined the Howe First Aid at the age of 15. I was one of the first cadets in June of 1976. My name is Bob Morris. I joined in 1978 as a cadet. I was on the cadet corps for two years. 1980, I came up to the senior squad as a probationary member. My name is Don Kunz. I joined the Howe First Aid around 1977. 
Uh, my name is Patty Williams. I joined the cadets um, in February, February 5th of 1983. And then I joined senior squad, or when I turned 18, uh, December 5th of uh, 1984. I'm Jeff Devadio. Yeah. I joined the first aid squad in 1985 as a cadet. And then I rejoined as a senior squad member in 1994. My name's John Zicka. I joined the first aid squad in 1998 and during that time I've served as the first lieutenant, second lieutenant, sergeant positions, took several years off in between, became a trustee and I've served as the president since 2013. In the late, in the late 60s we, we really went through a major transition and that was the, the community grew like crazy with the building of Salem Hill, Canwood yeah. we picked up like over uh, must be what eight nine hundred homes there other little developments and we were operating that time with uh, with two rigs we had when I first joined and there's still pictures of it a little old white ambulance I it was an old caddy I think it was a 47 or 48 and then we got the uh, 58 caddy when I came in and as I say as we were transitioning the community grew the 58 caddy got sight swiped or actually t-boned by a Lakewood police car at the intersection of uh, 88 and uh, Ocean Avenue in Lakewood. So we lost that. We managed, Lakewood sold us the little international that you'll see pictures of. It's a, uh, I think it was a, a late 50s, the blue, red and white one. We, we got that, we had problems with the rectifier on that. And then we went to the township, that's when we went to the township and we told them that we can't exist the way we are, we need help. Because the township was only limited to give us, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was $5,000. And the rest we had to raise. We actually went house to house. And you look at the area that we covered, going house to house, fund drive, it took most of the spring and the summer to get that done. People would give us pretty good donations, and the ladies were great. The ladies' auxiliary was great. They worked real hard for us. And every year, at the end of the year, they'd give us a two or $3,000 check. That was quite a bit of money them today. They ran all kind of affairs here, so we could increase and we had the money to buy equipment that we needed. So they were big help, big help to ladies. John's mentor and his wife, at the time, we, we had a very, very strong ladies auxiliary and they used to work hard and have dinners for us to help raise monies and uh, at times when we needed supplies like cravats and all, it'd get, get the material and it'd do the cutting of the cravats and the sewing and all and, and work closely with the squad m members. Uh, John's wife was, uh, was on the, on the uh, ladies auxiliary with uh, a lot of our members um, who, who did have wives at the time uh, supported us that way too. My, uh, myself, uh, when I was on the squad, it, it, it started to, to dwindle down the, the, uh, the ladies auxiliary, which is unfortunate, but at the same time uh, with uh, all the young, young um, fellas and, and stuff, the, the uh, cadet squads were, were building up and, um, and uh, supporting the, the call, calls and everything. Back in the day, we were dispatched by a little box called a plectron. You would take the plectron home, it would go off, you would have tones go off, you would respond to the building, and you'd go out on your call. Then we got hit with, we lost some of our, the wives who were dispatchers. So we ended up, we had to go into Hawk and buy an instant alert system. And that we had, uh, it was like the plectron, but it was called instant alert. Everybody had a radio in their house and it was dispatched from, it could be activated here, and at that point, the uh, state police moved into the barracks on, uh, on 524 near Our House Tavern, and uh, that's where they were dispatching us from. Then we got hit with Monmouth County, they decided that the radios we had were no longer good, because they were, they, I think they worked on AM and received on FM, they were, when you used to start them, you actually would see the, the lights go down on the ambulance because they drew that much electricity. And the other problem we had in the New York City Fire Department had a major blaze on Staten Island, they would just blow us off the radio because they were so powerful, even with their trucks, they would knock us off. So in that 
period, we lost an ambulance, we had to buy one, we had to go to, you know, to the instant alert systems. We were just totally, you know, bankrupt. And then, <laughs> the last thing, Highway 9 didn't have dividers on it like it does now. We had some bad accidents on the highway. Bad accidents. <laughs> but Highway 9 was brutal for us. Uh, without the divider, everything, head-ons. That's all we had was head-ons. Remember, no seat belts in the cars back then. No airbags in the cars back then. You got there, the people were many times not in the cars. And you had some tremendous, horrific accidents that we used to have to deal with, and that's why we had to buy the equipment to, uh, to deal with it. We were the first ones, other than Belmar, we were the first ones to buy a truck like this. And we bought it from a guy, he was, this was the last vehicle he sold from a place in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. Then he went into business for himself, p &L, which is uh, over there on uh, the road to Manasquan. He started that company. In fact, I saw he died a couple years ago. So we bought that on a Ford chassis. We had a guy, we used to have some horrendous accidents, who put in an air chisel for us. And he put a compressor on the engine, like much like a, uh, a, uh, like a, it looked like an alternator. Or, and then we had, you know, the lines ran in the back so we could use the air chisel. Many times we'd have the fire department come out with us and they had a saw, a carbide saw. But it got to the point where we had to go for jaws of life. And we were the first one in the area with, you know, with jaws of life. One of the first rigs in the state that was equipped with the jaws of life. And um, we modified the, the um, the rig to, to have payoff reels and stuff and a lot of extrication. Uh, we, we tried keeping on top of state of the art at the time. First in the area with airbags. We, I brought the airbags into the, into, the, um, into the rigs. When I first joined we had two nice Cadillacs which uh, the present, president is taking care of right now to restore one of them. And we had a van and a few trucks. We had 1965, which uh, they called the White Elephant. It was an extrication unit that was, um, when it was bought, it was over, like oversized, too heavy. So it was a bear to get out. It was a special stick shift, only a couple people could drive it. Um, we had 1963, which was a 1976 long nose Chevy, um, which was my favorite rig because it just was you know, a nice big heavy rig. You didn't have to worry about sliding in bad weather. And, um, and then through the years, we had a couple of brawns we called the Twins. We got other box trucks, kind of stayed away from the vans because the vans are not good in bad weather. It did have a 5758 were Cadillacs. And I, I do know that one of the Cadillacs uh, we had, was able to uh, go through I would say probably two and a half feet of snow when I hit the intersection of Aldridge Road and Route 9. It kind of just air, went almost plowed airborne through through the the, uh, the side of the road had, had they plowed 9 and and uh, they were good. We, we it, it brought us to the era where we had to get uh, uh, scoops and, and, and uh, different types of uh, baskets to, uh, to go through a lot of snows. A lot of times we can get out in the back roads out to, out to the street with luck from the township plowing ahead of us, but from there to the house it was always, we'd, we'd uh, have to put them in something and pull them across the, the snow and stuff. Um, Cadillacs were great, they're good gas mild. In fact, that's, that's where my first delivery was in the back of a Cadillac, and I don't remember, but I think we had, besides a patient, seven members in, in the ambulance. Because if you go on a, a, a delivery and we deliver, we all get stork pins, so everybody was, you know, wanted a double-decker in the front and in the back and all that stuff. We, I think, uh, had, one Papalilla, I think, was in the back with me. Uh, we had some cadets because my my um, my brother was there as, as a cadet. And um, when I asked for the OB kit, he he pulled the OB kit and then 
we were driving up the road, and I think, uh, I don't remember who was driving, but after talking with the patient and the, the, her facial uh, grimaces and stuff, I'm saying, well, you know, I hate to do this, but I'm gonna have to, to um, take a look. And of course, uh, she wasn't supposed to be delivering, but when I saw the crowning of the head, uh, I turned to whoever was next to me and said, you know, stop the rig and went to the next one, stop the rig, and then the windows opened up to the front cab, stop the rig, and then the next thing, the brakes were hit and we almost all delivered the, <laughs> the baby at the same time. But during the excitement, uh, you know, get the old big kid and, you know, grabbing and trying to open it, and it, all of a sudden, boom, everything in the back of the rig goes flying, suction bowl, our gloves, everything was sterilely wrapped, but it was just, uh, Instantly, you know, a matter of a couple of seconds, that we had delivered a, a girl at the time. And, uh, but again, uh, one of those good times. When I was a youngster, about seven, eight years old, my family was involved in a car accident on Aldridge Road. And the first aid squad got called out to help the injured party in the other car. And just to see the way the people came out and the care that they gave the um, young lady that was injured in the other vehicle, I was like, that really impressed me. And then of course, growing up watching the TV show Emergency. Yeah, that had a lot of, big impression on a lot of people that came into uh, EMS, especially back in the late 70s. The first year I was captain, or the year I became captain, the first thing I did was went over to town hall and asked them to replace one of our ambulances that they owned, that they bought for us back in 1981. It was our cardiac care unit. The truck was constantly in the garage. It spent more time on the tow truck than it did answering calls. And it took the whole year, but we eventually did get a brand new ambulance. In fact, the township bought ambulances for all three squads at the time, at the same time, which was the first. So my mom joined the squad in December, December 5th, 1984. And the funny thing about how she got started on the squad was, I was already a cadet, I was a riding cadet for a year and a half. My sister was on the squad, but my sister Maria um, had cancer and she ended up dying from that. She died in October of 85. So when my mom wanted to um, thank the squad and all. She had some of the members come to the house and they had said that they were coming over to the house. They wanted her to sign some papers. And those papers were for, you know, some kind of insurance, whatever that they, you know, pretended that that's why they were there. So they asked my mom questions. What's your name? What's your birth date? Um, what, um, you, know, uh, you know, phone number, stuff like that. And she signed the papers, didn't look at them, you know, trusted them. Graham Dillaway was one of them, John Rainey was the other. And um, December 5th, I was still waiting to get onto the squad because my birthday was October 4th. And I was waiting, they hadn't brought me up at the time. So when they called the house, they said, you know, congratulations, Patty, you're on senior squad. Let me talk to your mother. So I gave mom the phone and they said to mom, congratulations, you're on the squad. And she said, no, I didn't fill out an application. We had talked about it, but I didn't fill one out. And they said, no, you did. All the papers that they got her to sign and all the information that they asked her were an application. They filled it out, had her sign her name. She didn't know and brought her onto the squad. So she's been on senior squad or she was on senior squad for the same amount of time I was. We rode calls together, went to EMT class together cadet advisors together. Although she was a cadet advisor for over 20 years, I was a cadet advisor here and there helping out. Um, when I was president, she was my secretary. The other time I was president, she was my vice president. So we were always together, always answering calls. Saturday night duty crew with Kevin Floridan was like the, the best crew. And um, she was a good person. Yeah, everybody loved her. She really um, gave her all to the squad. And like I said, the, the time that the following year, my dad died. Um, I was a senior in high school. He died in May of heart disease. So we lost my sister in October, then my dad in May. So my brother was in the service. It was just me and mom, and we just didn't want to stay home. So what we did was we came down here, and that's why I got top call. She got second, 
and then she got top calls, I got second, because we didn't want to just be home sitting staring at the walls. So we just came down here and we were down here all the time. So that's how we ended up joining the squad, or how she ended up joining the squad. I was captain for 20 years. When I was captain, I had a lot of um, goals that I set. When I first became captain, I was hoping I was going to stay in for two to three years. And uh, I remember the day I was elected, I was hoping at least two years for a goal. I wanted to get new trucks. At one point, we were borrowing trucks, uh, ambulances from Jackson First Aid, um, Ramtown, Farmingdale. And I turned a lot of that around with fighting with the town, going after getting new equipment, and we were able to get all new equipment. Um, and then as I became the captain for more years, I had more goals, and I wanted to redo the buildings. And eventually we put up the new building in 2007, and that stored all our vehicles inside. Most of the time our vehicles were outside in the snow. Uh, when we had an extrication call, our extrication unit was outside. Uh, when it was snowing, we'd have to clear the snow off of it before we would go on a call. Um, after that building was built in 2007, we started working on the old building. Uh, we redid the whole basement, redid the kitchen, and then recently in 2016, we ripped the roof off of the old building and made the building higher. Uh, the problem was with the newer rigs, we were not able to fit them in the building. The, the doors were too low, so we ripped the entire roof off, raised the building four feet, and redid the entire bays over there. Um, we also redid the, the entire property. Outside, planted sod, all the members helped get together. We had sprinklers put in, we, we put sod, we made a picnic area, um, paved the entire parking lot. We put uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars into both buildings to have what we have today. And at that point, we dedicated the hall to John Menchner and made it Menchner Hall. A lot of the, the work that was done around here was done by a lot of the members. And mostly at nighttime, at two, three in the morning, we would just start ripping things apart. I remember one night we said, we're gonna redo the kitchen. And two o'clock in the morning, we started ripping sheetrock off the walls and we redid the kitchen. Um, and it was all done by the members to save money. So we didn't have to go out and spend that the money on the improvements. We were able to spend it on equipment that we needed. Every holiday we had barbecues, and we had big barbecues where the families all came. And we had 70, 80 people here for Memorial Day, 4th of July barbecues. And, we, and it continues today. They still have their Memorial Day parties and 4th of July, but that was one of the ways that we were able to get a lot of members because people were bringing their friends here and their friends seeing how we were hanging out, we were, we were having barbecues or even on a duty crew night, we would have barbecues outside. Uh, Monday night duty crew would put out a thing, we're having a barbecue, hamburgers and hot dogs, and the squad bought the food and people would come down and, and some of these other people brought their friends down and their friends wound up joining because they, they enjoyed what we did. And that's how I think our membership grew. When I took over as captain, we had 32 members. Um, today we have over 85 members. So, the, and the life members, the amount of life members we have now is unbelievable. I, I don't even know the count of life members. John Menchner started the first aid squad in 1957. Uh, through those years, he has been with us all the way. Uh, he still attends all of our squad meetings. Uh, for the past 22 years I've been on the squad, he's been at every installation dinner. And for the last 10 years, he's sworn the officers in at each and every one of the installation dinners, including this year. All yours, John. Okay, please raise your right hand. Hey, they all did it right. 
John Menchner is, I would consider him basically the patriarch of the first aid squad. Uh, the fact that he still likes to come down. Whenever he comes down and speaks to any of the members, he always is so proud of the organization and where it is today. And he always says, I could never imagine looking at this place, seeing the way it is today when I decided to start the first aid squad so many years ago. It was a real good experience. I remember this for the rest of the day until I croak. I remember everything we did. We had the laughs, we had the cries. You know, but um, we got sick from some of the calls we went to. Uh, but it was a hell of an experience. If anybody wants to do something from their heart, this is the place to do it or any place like this to do it. And then one year, Freehold ran a thing where they wanted the best first aid man, the best fireman, and the best policeman. And all them groups wrote letters of who they thought they had in their group. And they, they submitted them. And my was the one they picked for the best first aid man of the year. I got a plaque home, it, it tells you. The date, I don't remember the date, but it was quite a while ago. And I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs>